What unit did you fight with? The 100th Battalion, Company C. E Company, 2nd Platoon, 3rd Squad. My husband was in Company E, MIS. My brother, uh, who, who was in MI, MIS. My father, Martin uh, Lloyd Ito, was uh, 442. 442nd. K Company, MIS. 442nd. 100th Battalion. My dad was a first lieutenant with Company I in the 442. When Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, it was the second time the world went to war. It was the most widespread and deadliest war in history, involving more than 100 million people from over 30 countries. 3% of the world's population, over 60 million people, died. America suffered military losses of over 1 million killed or wounded in action. 16 million Americans served before the bloodshed was over. More than 24,000 were Nisei, second generation Japanese Americans. San Diego, the second largest city in California, is proud to call 118 of those Nisei soldiers their own. Today we are here at the San Diego Veterans Museum and Memorial Center, sharing the stories with a few remaining Nisei veterans and their families, and the families of those who've passed away. It is a day to honor, to reflect, and to pass on their legacy. On December 7th, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, propelling the U.S. to enter the war, and anti-Japanese sentiment was on the rise. What do you remember about that day? Well, we were fishing uh, off of Panama, and uh, we were icing the fish at midnight, uh, and a uh, skipper come down and said, uh, Japan attacked uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, next morning, that uh, gunship from uh, Panama came over, had the guns right on us. We were going to go to the football game, but then we couldn't go. And I know being in San Diego, it was a rough town. Guys were getting beat up. Japanese Americans were getting beat up? Because of the attack on Pearl Harbor? Oh, yeah. Well, it's a Navy town. Mm. You have two older brothers, and when we got home, the FBI came rushing in. Were you scared? Then I was scared, uh-huh. Because uh, we had someone come in through the front door and the back door. I think they just barged in, uh-huh. They just rounded up all the uh, 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 first generation men and to continue. Early in the morning of December 7th, Two detectives came to the door. They wanted to take my dad for questioning. How old were you at the time? I was 19. In the weeks following Pearl Harbor, the FBI arrested hundreds of Japanese, Buddhist priests, Japanese language teachers, photographers, and businessmen, anyone they considered enemy aliens, including 271 from San Diego, most ending up at Crystal City internment camp in Texas. President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942, authorizing the removal of all people of Japanese ancestry. Two months later, the order reached Southern California. The San Diego Japanese community had six days to sell or store whatever possessions they had and were allowed to take only what they could carry. Uh, my father was a uh, fisherman. Uh, he started fishing in the mid-20s and uh, he had a boat called Enterprise, he was a captain. Then what happened to you? We only had about a week's time to get rid of it. And nobody wants to buy it, and the weeks was up. So we had to just, just about give it away, like 10 cents on a dollar. 1,150 Japanese and Japanese Americans, 306 families, left San Diego by train on April 7, 1942. Farmers left their equipment. Fishermen left their boats. 
they uh, put us on the train. Uh, we live Santa Anita racetrack in the stable for two and a half months. That's where the sea biscuit was. And we got tetanus shots to clean out the stables because this hay was still there. So we didn't know what we were going to do. And then where did you go from there? Then we went to Poston, Arizona, Mill, in the desert. Just dusty and dirty and uh, hot. What, what kind of sticks in your mind when you think about that era? They gathered up all these people and they stripped them of all their rights, their citizenships, and they put them in the camps. They took everything away from them. We were actually railroaded. So it, it was a terrible time. This is a perfect example of the Constitution is only as good as the government that wants to enforce it. Why were they there in the first place? I mean, they were there uh, internment camps for their protection. They were concentration camps. They had armed guards. But if they were in their camps for their own protection, why were the guns pointed at them, not at the outside? If you tried to escape through the barbed wire, they'd shoot you. They'd kill you immediately. They were U.S. citizens, and they were victims. When did you two meet? I was in Poston, Arizona, and he used to come on furloughs to the camp. When did you get married? Uh, it's 44? Uh, yeah. We've been 1944. So you were right in the middle of the war when you guys right. got married. Right, uh-huh. She thought I was too old for her. <laughs> <laughs> I told her age doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> in June of 1942, 1,432 Nisei men of the Hawaiian Territorial Guard were activated as a Hawaii Provisional Infantry Battalion, the 100th of the U.S. Army, and sent to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, and later Camp Shelby, Mississippi, for combat training. In January 1943, the Army issued a call for Japanese-American volunteers and accepted 4,000 from Hawaii and 1,500 from the internment camps on the mainland. Designated the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, they joined the 100th Battalion at Camp Shelby, I had myself and five brothers in our family, five of us in there at the same time, serving in the military. The households with people in the service had a gold store hanging on the doors. I don't remember that kind of stuff or not. I, I, I don't sure, but I think our family is the only one that had five gold stores up there. Meanwhile, Japanese Americans serving in the Military Intelligence Service, the MIS, received their training at the Presidio Army Base in San Francisco and later Camp Savage, Minnesota, sending over 3,000 Nisei to almost every U.S. military unit in the Pacific Campaign. The 100th Battalion shipped out on August 11, 1943, landing in North Africa, joining the 34th Red Bull Division the first division from the U.S. to enter combat. Battle ready, the 442nd Regiment shipped out on May 1st, 1944, with 2nd and 3rd Battalions in their support, the 522nd Field Artillery, and the 232nd Combat Engineers, joining the 100th Battalion in Italy. Their motto, go for broke. That's pretty hard. Uh, when I first went in there, I was kind of scared, you know? But uh, after a couple of weeks, I got used to seeing dead people. You know, it didn't bother me anymore. How do you describe what you went through? It was tough, you know, because you never knew when you were going to die. The 100th 442nd Regiment engaged in some of their heaviest fighting as they pushed through France, where they liberated the cities of La Broquaine, Belmont, Bifontaine and Briers. What do you know about his experience in the war? He saw his friends getting killed. He said uh, one time uh, the guy that was in the foxhole with him got shot. He was trying to save his life, so he put his hand over the, the wound and tried to save him as long as he could. But he says eventually, he, you know, he did die. He had been shot 
and then sent to the back of the line and was told two days later, you're okay, go back, do your job. And he was shot again two days later. He was shot through the neck. And apparently he kept going. And one of his buddies said, what are you doing? You're bleeding from the neck. And he didn't feel it. It had passed all the art arteries. He was laying on a stretcher and he was all bandaged up, bleeding all everywhere, had his eyes closed. And his best friend uh, in I company, he comes up to him and says, Hank, Hank, are you dead? And he goes, hell no, I ain't dead. <laughs> Tank fired up in the uh, trees and the shrapnel come down. What was that like, fighting in Briere and fighting in France? Well, that was as bad as it ever was. <laughs> he was describing how the shells were not coming in from the side, but they were hitting the trees. And the shrapnel was just incredible, was coming down on them. He had a shrapnel in his kidney, which missing his other vital parts by inches, of which the rest of my family wouldn't even, and myself would not be here today. The battle to rescue the lost battalion, the first battalion of the Texas 141st Regiment in the Vosges Mountains in France, is considered today one of the 10 most significant battles of World War II. The fighting was fierce. The Germans had their orders, capture or kill the Texans. The Nisei soldiers had theirs, rescue them. He felt that it was a suicide mission because all these guys were going in and he goes, you know, we didn't have really much of a chance. But there was no mission impossible. Every mission was possible in his eyes. It was just an just a very tragic situation, but something they needed to do to save their fellow comrades. Well, they were the first ones in to the dangerous situations because, because of who they were. <laughs> and so that's why many of them were killed. They used them as the spearhead and, and they were right up front. And so uh, they had high casualties and they were getting shot out from every which way, uh, snipers and, and whatnot. Uh, mortars, and he said it was really, really dangerous. And as I looked around, I'm a staff sergeant, and I'm the highest ranking person in the eight people that came back. So all their officers got killed, all the high ranking noncoms got killed. You know, it was just those eight guys. The 100th 442nd Regiment saved 211 Texans while suffering over 800 casualties of their own. And a lot of his comrades died. He was surprised to live and they only saved a handful of people. So there were more casualties among their battalion than the people they saved. The price they, they made my father and my uncles pay was just outrageous. The 100th 442nd Regiment suffered an unprecedented casualty rate of 314%. They received over 18,000 individual medals, including 21 medals of honor, 52 distinguished service crosses, 560 silver stars, 28 with oak leaf clusters, over 4,000 bronze stars, 1,200 with oak leaf clusters, and 9,486 Purple Hearts. They earned eight presidential unit citations for their eight major campaigns in Italy and France, and emerged as the most decorated unit in the history of the United States Army. On July 15, 1946, President Harry S. Truman pinned their final unit citation on the 142nd Regiment's colors at a ceremony in Washington, D.C. You fought not only the enemy, but you fought prejudice, and you've won. Why do you think he was so proud of that? What they did for us, and we were in camp too, but they protected us too by going overseas, being in the service. 442nd and, and all the Nisei soldiers fighting knowing that their families were in a, you know, internment camp and you still did your job. You were still loyal to the U.S. 
but you were more loyal to your family. He did something you, that was great. This is the place they were born and they, they wanted to fight for the United States. I think it was one of the proudest moments of his life, serving with the 442. And I don't say that, I, I mean that, you know, with every fiber of my body, I really do. You were in the Korean War. Oh yeah, but uh, mine was nothing in comparison to what he did. He did something for his country. He need, I think he, what he did, I think he really helped show the world. How would you describe your father? He's, uh, he's my hero, yeah. On November 2nd, 2012, Congress presented the entire units of the 1442nd Regiment and the MIS with our country's highest civilian award, the Congressional Gold Medal. It's part of history and we should always be proud of what they did. It is something that, you know, that needs to be um, remembered. You know, my father and all his fellow soldiers established, you know, a basic freedom for all of us. The sacrifices they made for our community to, to make things better for us. And that's something I tried to pass on to, to my children. You are not who you are, but you are the product of your past generations. And out of honor and respect, it is our duty to pass that message on. We weren't the quiet generation. We are more, you know, we want this to be told generations. For a country who prides itself on freedom and supporting freedom, um, the fact that this happened with Japanese Americans I think is something as a lesson to be learned and passed down to future generations. What were you thinking when he's talking about his father, your grandfather? Um, that he had a really strong bond, I guess, with his father. What do you think about that? That's really good. What do you know about your grandfather? that he went out to fight for his, like what he believed in. Why do you think it's important that he had such a great influence on your father? Hmm, because he taught everything he could and he passed that down. Anything else you want to say about him? He must have been a great father to you. Thank you. You guys are great. You're adorable. You're so cute. This is the legacy of the Nisei soldier, the World War II generation, the greatest generation, proud, honorable, and brave, faithful husbands, true friends, good fathers, and grandfathers. So tell me about Mount Hope. Cemetery. Well, Mount Hope is where many of your uh, Issei uh, pioneers are buried. Um, it's somewhat of a segregated city-owned cemetery, and uh, this is where my grandfather buried in 1953, and then my dad in 2011. So when we come to this beautiful cemetery and you see your family's headstone, what does this mean to you? Well, you know, I, I come here and I touch the dash, right? both my grandfather and my dad and, you know, 1917, 2011, the dash, I mean, it, you know, there, there's that poem, right? And uh, when I did my dad's eulogy, I really talked about the dash of uh, growing up here in San Diego, being uh, from a farming family, uh, Pearl Harbor, internment, volunteering. Um, I'm, I live in San Diego, so it, it gives me a lot of comfort to be able to, you know, stop in periodically and uh, talk to my dad because, um, I really missed him. <laughs> this is the legacy that we will never forget.